Well, how's it going, everybody? How are we doing this morning? Anybody excited to be in church? Uh, who's ready for like summer all over again? Who was, who, who was ready to go swimming first thing this morning? Ooh, it was brutal outside this morning. Well, hey, glad to be with you today. So glad to have each of you in church. I look around the room and just, man, I just, I'm filled with so much joy. I, we love that we get to be your pastors. Love that we get to be church family. Love that we're gathered together today because I believe there's nothing like this moment where we allow Jesus to speak life and health and, and purpose over us. And so when I say that, like, who's excited to go to God's word? I'm always, I'm so excited. I'm, let's go. Let's go. We're going to have church today. It's going to be fun. I believe the Lord's really going to meet us today. And uh, we're in the last week of a four-part series called I'm In. Talk about that in just a minute. But what I want to do is just like I do every single week is look right into the camera and say hello to everyone who's watching us at Church Online. So grateful that we've got technology that lets us be in the same room together. So no matter what reason you're, you're watching, we're so glad that we're connected. Whether you're watching live or maybe you're catching up on demand later in the week, we're so glad that you're with us. Hey, everybody in the room, will you do me a favor and say hello to everyone who's watching Church Online? We love you. We love you, and we get, we get an email or a text almost every week saying, hey, whenever you do that, it always means so much because I wasn't able to join, so thanks for jumping in. It is more fun when you play along when you're here in the room. I'm just telling you, that's in the Bible. Um, it's really not, but it's funny. Um, hey, this week, I want to let you know we're coming up. It's going to be first Wednesday on Wednesday night, and uh, if you've never joined us for a first Wednesday service, it's one of our favorite nights that happens every single month where uh, we come together as a church family from third grade up. We're all in the same room. So it's youth group for the night. It's kids church for the night. And that's uh, where we worship. We come to the altar and we, you know, we really press in and dig in. It's where we take communion. So you may be wondering like, hey, we've never taken communion at this church. We take communion every month that first Wednesday and I want to invite you out for this because I think this is actually going to be one of our most special ones. We've got some missionary friends that are coming. And because of where they serve in the world, I can't share who they are or where they're going. It's one of the reasons why we don't live stream First Wednesday so we can make room for some of these missions guests. I, I want you to come. I want, you to, I want your kids to hear the story of God at work through their lives. They were actually, uh, this missionary was actually arrested and held for 24 hours and then deported and believers in their country are still in prison because of their faith. Not only do we need to hear that story, but we need to come around these missionaries and pray along with them. So it's going to be a special night. Come on out. Doors open at 6.30. Services at 7. There's always a family after party. I heard that there might be donut holes this time. It's going to be great. It's one of our favorite nights of the week, and I don't want you to miss it, so come on out for that. Next week, we're starting a brand new series. Uh, my pastor, Pastor Chris Hodges, wrote a book a couple of years ago. Uh, you might remember uh, it, it was released in March of 2020, and there were some things that happened in March of 2020, but this book was called Out of the Cave, and it was a conversation about depression and anxiety. It's been a while since we've talked about spiritual and mental health as a church. And so we're going to use his book. And actually his book is a framework of the story of the prophet Elijah when he dealt with depression and anxiety and spoiler alert, like suicidal thoughts. And I think it's an important conversation. So I want you to come out. It's at least going to be two weeks. It might be four. We'll see how it goes. But I think the Lord wants to do something incredible in us for that. And lastly, this is how we end every week. If you're new with us, this is fun if you play along too. Um, don't be weirded out by it. It's one of the reasons why we do that two minute mingle. Um, we take five minutes at the end of our service just to connect, maybe just in groups of two or three people sitting around us to talk about what the Lord just shared with us through the message. And so as we go through scripture, as we go through my talk this morning, I want you to be listening with this set of questions as a filter. What's one thing, one thing, if you walked away with this, this is what the Lord is saying to me today. I want you to hold on to that because I want you to walk it out this week. So what's one next step that you can take with what the Lord is showing you? And then let's take time to pray together. We prayed together during our worship time, but let's pray together before we, we leave and head out for our weeks. Does that sound like a good day? Let's go. Let's pray. Jesus, thanks so much for bringing us together today. You are doing something incredible in this church body. And we just want to say, I'm in. 
Lord, whatever you're doing, we're in. And so as we go to your word today, will you speak life and health and meaning and purpose over us? Lord, would you show us what it means to be a follower of you through your word today? Lord, we give you this space. We want you to speak. We're listening. And we pray it in your name. Amen? Amen. Hey, we're wrapping up. I'm in. My prayer for this series kind of going in, and actually I pray this over every message that we have as a church family, is my prayer is that this is helpful. My prayer is that this is filled with hope, that it's hopeful for you, that every time we go to God's word, that it's, it's life giving. And I actually, I, I love that little video. We, those are called bumper videos, a little video that we show at the, at the beginning of the message. I actually think this one is really actually meaningful. Kind of, it's just like, a, usually it's like got fun music and it's kind of a simple way to break up and grab everybody's attention. I think this one is actually really meaningful. I love the, the visual of this little coal that's all off by itself. And you can kind of tell it's maybe glowing just a little bit. But something happens to it when it's pushed toward the rest of the fire. And then it catches fire itself. Did you notice that in the video? It's one of the reasons we've been having this conversation. Because I think what can happen in the busyness of life and just all the things that we've got going on, it's so easy to feel isolated and not a part of what's going on. And so this four-week conversation has really been trying to help us individually and collectively kind of move closer to the family of God so that we get set ablaze again. Each week has been a play on that, on that title, I'm In, with a word that starts with the letters I-N. The first week we talked about the fact that we're all invited to the family of God. Like we've been invited to his table. And because we were once invited, we invite other people. It, it just sets the table for all of these conversations that we've been having. Week two, we talked about, and this is a hard one for a lot of us because we don't feel it. We talked about that we are invaluable to God's family, that everyone is created on purpose, for a purpose, that everyone is intentionally designed, created in the, the image of God. And because we know we're created in the image of God, that shapes how we see people who are far from God that we need to invite them because they're made in the image of God. They need someone to speak that life over them. Last week, we talked about the fact that we're all influencers. Who went home and said, I'm an influencer? Uh, no joke. We were, was it at lunch? I pulled up my phone. Who were we with at lunch the other day? And like later on in that same day, talking about being an influencer for Jesus, I had an ad pop up on my phone for the Amazon Influencer Program. Man, they're listening. They're listening. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm just saying. But we're called to be influencers. Jesus said that we're called to be salt and light. Salt makes everything taste just a little bit better. And light makes everything just a little bit brighter there. We're called to influence the people around us. And it's really the conversation I want to pick up today is that together we have influence because we're the body of Christ. Together we have influence because we're the church. And the big thought that I want to bring today is this, that because I'm a part of the body, because I'm a part of the church, I'm in. And I'm invested in the work of God's kingdom. I'm invested in the work of God's kingdom. Now listen, some of you are going to say, you know, I, especially if you're new with us, you know, all churches do is talk about money. And I'm going to say it this way. We're not necessarily having a conversation about money. We're not not talking about it. But what we're going to talk about today is the difference between the spirit of greed and the spirit of generosity. I want to talk about what generosity actually means. And we're going to show it to you in scripture today. Some of you might say this, well, I'm not really invested in anything. Like I'm not really invested here at the church. I'm not really invested in things going on in life. Some of you might just say, I just, I don't, I don't see it. I don't feel it. But if you really think about it, I think each and every one of us can identify something in our lives that we could circle and say, oh no, well, I'm, I'm actually invested in that. I'm, I, I may not feel like I'm invested, but you know, we adjust our entire family schedule to do our kids' activities. I'm actually invested in making my kids' activities happen. 
Or I'm really invested in um, El Cubano because I go there twice a week and get a Cuban sandwich. I'm just saying. Um, some of you might say, well, you know, I don't, I don't really invest in the stock market. I don't really care about it. But once you have money invested in the stock market, you start to really care because you're literally invested in how things are going, right? Um, I was just trying to think of different examples. And um, many of you know, I'm actually in, I'm in the, the kind of the final, final couple months of my uh, master's program. And one of the classes that I had to take in my master's program was a zero credit pass-fail class that was kind of like an intro class. And if you know anything about the way the college is set up, uh, how much do you pay for a zero credit class? Nothing. It is nothing. So I had no investment in it. It was just busy work. Um, it took me three times to do that class because I was not invested in it. Uh, but the classes that I'm paying for that are very expensive, I'm really invested in making sure I'm getting my money's worth and getting good grades in those classes. When a, a, a relationship matters, we invest in our relationships, right? We invest time, we invest energy, we invest in relational output. Um, when Beth and I were, were first, were, were new parents, this was you know, so long ago, two decades ago now, um, we were a, a one-car family. We shared a car. We worked at the same place up until she had the baby. So we only needed one car, but all of a sudden she's a mom and now I'm driving to work. We didn't have two cars. So our dads went in together to buy us our first, our first second car. I knew how I wanted to say it. I just tripped myself up. And uh, I have, actually have a picture of this. It's, it's not this exact car, but it was this exact model, same color, 1990 Honda Accord EX. This is like my favorite car I've ever owned. I love that car. It was so fun to drive. It ran great, got great mileage. It had a manual handbrake. Come on, somebody. It was so much fun to drive. Um, my boys called that my trash car. <laughs> They called it my trash car. I'm like, what are you talking about? So they remember, even as little kids sitting in their car seats or in their booster seats, this is what they say. I think they're lying, um, but where's Ben Kranz? Where are you, Ben? Yeah, you like totally outed me saying, oh, it's true. It's full of garbage. Like my boys would say, our feet touched garbage in the back seat. I, I think they're lying but I can't defend myself because I don't have pictures or anything like that. I didn't pay for the car, so I really wasn't invested in caring for it. Are you tracking with me? 10 years later, I bought a brand new car, a 2013 Toyota Camry. I still drive, and nobody's allowed to eat in that car. <laughs> don't even look at it sideways. Don't breathe on it. Why? Because I'm invested in that car. I want it to last. I remember a number of years ago, uh, we had an elder retreat, and uh, I was here at the church, and myself, John Sweeney, and Randy Covert were all riding together, and we had to stop for dinner on our way up to our elder retreat, and we stopped at A&W for, you know, a root beer stand. Like, come on, that was awesome, right? And I'm ordering, and I'm like, yeah, we're going to eat here. And John Sweeney goes, we're going to eat in the car, right? I'm totally outing John Sweeney. I love you, John, wherever you might be. And he goes, we're going to eat in the car, right? I'm like, why? What'd you order? He goes, a chili dog. I'm like, no, you're not eating a chili dog in my car. And I wish I could have found it. I have a picture. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, put it on Instagram or something later this week. I have a picture. We stopped at Toby's for caramel rolls. Kobe's caramel rolls, anybody, right? We stopped at Toby's for caramel rolls. I've got a picture of Randy Covert, like leaning out of the car with the box right under his face, taking a giant bite. Why? Because I'm invested in my car and no one eats in my car. You want to know who the first person was that ate a full meal in my car was? Sherry Khalees. <laughs> we had Arby's. We had Arby's in the car. Remember, we were come, driving back from lacrosse. Why? Because I was invested. I want to take care of my car. Now it's funny, but it kind of lands, right? When something matters, we invest in it. If we look closely at our lives, I bet we could find 
areas in our lives that we are highly invested in. The problem I think that many of us face because of the culture that we live in and just the pressures of doing life in 21st century America, so many of the things that we invest our time and our, our, our finances in, well, they really don't last. They don't have a lasting impact. They don't have a legacy. Very few of us probably think that way, but one of the things I want to talk about today is the legacy of a spirit of generosity. Things that make us say, I can't wait to invest my time and energy and money in. We've been going to Jesus. We've been going to the Matthew. We've been in Matthew chapter 5 the last couple of weeks. I actually want to show you a couple of verses in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus is talking about where we are investing our lives. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, he says this. He says, don't store up treasures here on earth. Everyone say, store up. Store up. I want you to hold on to that phrase. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroy them and where thieves break in and steal. Verse 20, he says, store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust can't destroy and thieves can't break in and steal. And the reason is what he says in verse 21. He says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. This is a challenging teaching from Jesus because he's cutting right into our hearts. He's cutting right to the very core of our motives. Many of us know the teaching in Matthew chapter 6. He starts talking about the worry of provision. He says, you worry about so many things in life. And I'm sure if we talked about it across the table, like if we were having coffee and just talking about life, it'd be easy to start talking about the things that worry us. I talk to people all the time when they start talking about finances or missions giving or different things happening in life. We look around at the prices. We look around at the stock market and we're filled with worry and fear and stress and dread. And I'll just say it. I get it. I get it. I, I worry about those things Two, but we live in this tension of what Jesus said in verse 21. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And he breaks it down for us starting in verse 24. And this is a challenging statement. He says in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. For you'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. And he brings it home with this statement. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. There's a tension that Jesus is pointing out. He's talking about a tension that's happening in our hearts. It's not that money's bad. Money's necessary. We need it. But the key word here is serve. The key word in this passage is serve. I love how the New Living Translation uh, translates this as being enslaved to money. Jesus points something out here that we wrestle with far too often. We're committed to him. We want to follow him. We love Jesus. We want to serve him. We want to grow and be more like him. But the pressures of life, of food, of clothing, of shelter, of time start taking over. They start taking over and we start wrestling with this tension. We start off with really good intentions and following him, but we end up serving the pursuit, the chase of money. Our hands are too full. We're trying to make ends meet. We're toiling. Like I'm all for good hard work. I, I love to work. We're made to work, but somewhere sneaky, something shifts from Jesus to money. The, the Aramaic word when Jesus says money here in this statement is actually the word mammon. Like the best translation of this, tra of this verse would be, you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is the Babylonian God of wealth and prosperity. Jesus was making a really specific statement here. He's not saying the money is the problem. He says our loyalties are shifting. Our loyalties are shifting. And so I, there's a great pastor down at Gateway Church down in Texas. His name is Pastor Robert Morris. He wrote a book called The Blessed Life. And he talked about some indicators of the spirit of mammon. Like, how do we know if we're actually pursuing the love of money or this love of wealth? It's a great list. It's challenging. It's not going to be on the screen, but you can jot just a couple notes down. Or, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to bring an indictment. I'm just trying, maybe we just look in the mirror just for a couple moments as we talk about this. 
What are some indicators of the spirit of mammon? This is a great list. Number one, you're always thinking about money. Your focus is either on what you don't have or what you want, and you seldom live in a place of contentment. Number two, you find yourself comparing your financial situation to others, your siblings, your friends, maybe other people in your age group. You maybe look at your lack and you grow envious or jealous of another person's plenty. Or you look at what others have and you try to outdo them. What do we call that? Like keeping up with the Joneses, right? Your success or identity, this one cuts pretty harsh. Your, your success or your identity as a, as a person is dependent on how much money you make. Or that you want your riches to make a statement to other people. How you look, your possessions, your job, maybe it's your house. You're buying whatever it is to make a statement to other people. Or it's gif- difficult for you to give joyfully or completely. You think your finances are yours to give. So there's this reluctance. There's this possessive spirit that comes with it. Or when you're giving, you focus more on what you're losing rather than what you're gaining in the giving. You might think something like this. Well, I guess I won't get to do this or I guess I won't get to have that or I won't get to go there if I give. Or your inner monologue shifts. Maybe you're sitting here right now and you're listening to me and you're getting restless or itchy. Maybe you're getting a little angry at me. Or maybe you're depressed or you start getting frustrated or maybe fear is starting to rise. Or maybe you're trying to ignore me, saying saying to me internally, don't tell me what to do. Okay. Or maybe you find your identity in what you have. You find your identity in your possessions because money can bring a sense of security, a sense of power, a sense of control, a sense of freedom or independence, and even a sense of significance. When you serve the spirit of mammon, what often happens with money is we become fearful or stingy or greedy are hard-hearted, are angry, selfish, or demanding with our money. Worry is one of the clearest signs that the spirit of mammon has your heart. You worry about how you're going to pay the bill, how you're going to get your needs met. When mammon has you, you're not sure whether God will fulfill his promise and meet your needs, so you're unsettled and nervous. It can undercut your trust in God. You're not sure if he'll come through. And it's reflected in how you pray. You're never satisfied. There's always something else or just a little bit more that needs to be had. And in America, one of the ways that this looks like is you live beyond your means. You tell God your provision isn't good enough. And we go into crushing, crushing credit card debt. Because we're unwilling to cut back because we have to keep up appearances. Living according to the spirit of mammon, it's actually a spirit, it's kind of a two-handed, a two-handed spirit that's at work. It's a spirit of greed that wants to accumulate as much as possible and an unwillingness to let it go. When God impresses on your heart to bless another person, your natural response is to recoil or to back away because of how it might actually impact you. It's the difference between being closed-fisted and open-handed. Closed-fisted, I gotta gotta hang on. I gotta hang on to what I have and I can never have enough. That's scarcity mindset. But provision mindset is there's always more than enough. It's this internal tension that we live with. But I wanna live in the spirit of, of generosity. I want you to live in a spirit of generosity. Ecclesiastes, the writer of Ecclesiastes says it so, so succinctly. Chapter four, verse six, he writes, better one handful with tranquility. Another translation says with peace, one handful with peace than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. What does he mean? Well, two, two hands that are full, striving, toil, full of worry, constantly battling because our hands are full and what happens when we're, when we're close-handed with our generosity, when we have too much going on, there's no margin. Well, there's also no room to receive 
anymore. You try to put something in my hands, two hands full of toil, it fall to the ground. There's no more room to receive. But one hand that's full of tranquility and full of peace means there's another hand that's available to receive. But better yet, there's a hand that's ready to give. There's a hand that's free and ready to give. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is speaking to our motives. There's where your treasure is, your heart is. Also, he's talking about our motives. It's a reminder that life is going to throw a lot at you, but you get to decide who you trust, and you get to decide what your posture is. So look what Jesus says at the end of Matthew chapter 6. Verse 31, he says this. So don't worry about these things. What things? He says this. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Interesting phrase, verse 32. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. And maybe they dominate your thoughts too. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. It's a key phrase. I bet we could go around the room, and if we were really honest, many of us could say that money easily dominates our thoughts because it's so tangible, it's so necessary, it's so right there, it's black and white and red in our bank accounts. It's easy to put our trust in money and things, but something in us changes when we start putting God first. And this is what Jesus brings home in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He says this, seek the kingdom of God above all all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Jesus is giving us the starting place for our priorities. In the NIV translates verse 33. It says, seek first God's kingdom. Jesus is inviting us to rearrange our lives, to get things in his order, to do things according to his Patterns. He's telling us, I know what you're facing, and if you will just follow me, if you will just trust me and start putting me first in every category of your life, I'm going to care for you in a way that money never could. And that's the issue that many of us have. Do we really trust our money and God? One more verse on this. I've preached this before. I don't want to focus on money. I want to focus on generosity. If you want to watch some of my messages on tithing, you can go. We've got those online. We can share those with you. But one of my favorite verses about the purpose of tithing is found in Deuteronomy. It's actually, in this version, it's from the Living Bible, Deuteronomy 14, 33. It's as clear as it can be. The purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. And you hear me say something about this almost every single week. Faithfulness and generosity go hand in hand. I recently had somebody ask me what I meant by that. I actually love talking about it because I think it's so, so freeing. It's the exciting part about being a, a, a part of the body of Christ. Faithfulness is the tithe. It's returning the tithe back to the Lord. Returning, or another version of the Bible will say, bring the tithe. And I think that's a key phrase. We're not giving a tithe, we're returning a tithe. It, it sets the ownership right. That we're bringing back God, we're being faithful to bring back to God what is already his. And that faithfulness is the starting point for generosity. The order matters. We don't want to give out in front of God. We want to be faithful with what's his and then give. We return the tithe back to the storehouse, the church, the place where we receive ministry. And then we are generous with our offerings, our gifts. How do you store up treasures in heaven instead of on earth? It's the spirit of generosity that we're talking about. Our core value is this, is that we want to walk out irrational, spirit-led generosity. It's, but it's, it's more than just, I hope you're hearing me on that. It's more than just money. There's an incredible spirit of generosity that can define us as Christ followers. We give because it's more blessed to give than receive. We're blessed to be a blessing. We're poured into so that we can pour out. We were never intended to be storehouses ourselves. We're intended to be poorhouses, P-O-U-R, not P-O-O-R. We're intended to pour out. We're blessed so that we can bless others. We're poured into so that we can pour out and bless 
others. That's what Jesus did. So when I say we get to look more like you, Jesus, when we're faithful and we're generous, it's because Jesus poured out his life for us, and now we get to pour out our lives for others. Are you tracking with me this morning? This is actually fun. I love talking about this. Generosity is exciting. This is awesome. This is exactly what I mean when I talk about faithfulness and generosity. This is what Jesus does. We're invited to be a part of this and we get to be invested in what God does. Luke chapter 12, we've done some parables of Jesus here in this series. Luke chapter 12, he tells a parable to help us get the point. He gets asked by someone, some, a guy comes up to Jesus and says, hey Jesus, tell my brother to split my inheritance so we can, like I want my money. Is basically the, the, the opening line of the story. Hey, Jesus, I, I want it's payday. Let's go. It, this guy will do it if you tell him to. It's actually, I think it's hilarious. Luke 12, starting in verse 15. This is Jesus' response. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Because life does not consist in, a, in an abundance of possessions. Those are Jesus' words. And then he told them this parable in verse 16. The, the ground of a certain rich man yielded in an abundant harvest. I love that phrase, abundant harvest. So he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Now, when we read verses 18 and 19, look at all of the first person. Here's what I'm going to do language. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I'll store up my surplus again. Verse 19, I'll say to myself, self, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Like, we just got rebate checks. Eat, drink, and be merry. Let's plan that vacation for MEA weekend. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? In verse 21, this is how it will be with whoever stores up. Everyone say stores up. Things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. It's a heart posture. Jesus warns us about this spirit. This is a warning. We're blessed to be a blessing, more blessed to give than to receive. It's not just a catchy phrase. It's the economy of God's kingdom that we're blessed in order to bless other people. When you walk out spirit-led generosity, when you invest in God's kingdom, you're part of something that's so much bigger than yourself. You're walking in the promises of God for yourself, and you're enabling other people to experience the presence of God. Blessed to be a blessing. When we walk this out, when we invest in God's kingdom, I'm not talking about financially. When we have a spirit of generosity, we step into this new economy that Jesus intends for his people. When we invest into people, into relationships, into ministries, we'll actually find that it has little to do with money, but rather more with our hearts. And this is what Paul writes about in 2 Corinthians. We're wrapping up here in just a couple minutes. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided to give in your heart. Not reluctantly, not out of compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That cheerful giver piece is key because it actually will tell us where our heart is. Where are we storing up treasures? Verse 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly. Oh, that's great. I receive that. Bless me, Jesus. I can't wait to have my storehouses built up and take care of me. No, there's a so that. God's able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That's generosity in action. I'm invested. Verse 11, you'll be enriched in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. That's blessed to be a blessing right there. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. What does it mean to be 
invested in God's kingdom. Can I just give you a couple practical things to go home with today? It means I'm just gonna pray, I'm gonna give, and I'm gonna go. Being invested means I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna give, and I'm gonna go. I'm invested by praying for God's work. I don't know where to start. Will you start praying for lost people? If you don't have the courage, and that's okay, it takes a lot to go and share Jesus with people. But you know what you can do? You can start praying for lost people in your lives. Start praying promises of God over lost people in your lives. Pray for opportunities to share your story in Jesus. This might sound really self-serving. I don't mean this to sound self-serving. Will you pray for your church? If you've never prayed for your church, will you start praying for your church? Will you pray for our ministries? Will you pray for our Sunday gathering? We're here every single Saturday at 9 a.m. praying for this gathering, praying for people to experience the fullness of God. Will you join us in praying for our kids' ministries? Will you join us in praying over our youth ministries? It's more critical than ever that we start praying over the next generation with our youth and our kids. Join us in that. Will you pray for your pastors? Like, would you start praying every day for your pastors? Pray for our board members. Pray for wisdom and guidance and direction that we're hearing from the Lord. I don't know where to start praying. Pray for missions. We have a, we have a list. If you don't have it, tell us. We'll give you it. We have a list of, of over 30 missionaries. You can pray for one missionary a day. You're praying every day for our missionaries. Pray for our global partners. Pray for our local ministry partners. They're incredible. They need our support. They need us invested in them. And I guarantee every missionary that you talk to will not talk about money first. They'll talk about prayer first. I'm invested. I'm invested by praying for God's work. And I'm invested by giving of my time, my talents, and my treasures. I talked a lot about money, but I want you to focus in and listen to the time and talents piece of this. We talked about it last week. If you missed last week, go back and watch it again. Join the life team. Be a part of serving other people. Join Go Local. Join Go Global. I don't know where to start. Start with some of these serve opportunities that are coming up. Join us at Treetop Farm for Serve Day. Join us for Trunk or Treat Serve Day. Discover your spiritual gifts. Put them to work for God's family. You'll be like that little coal in the video. I guarantee it. Instead of just being off by yourself, smoldering, trying to hope you're gonna set on fire for Jesus by yourself, Move in and watch what happens. The life team, it's where it's at. Step into regular giving, percentage giving. Step into missions giving. Be generous with your time. Invest in relationships. More than ever, we need people to invest in our young people. And I'll say young people, like even my age, because I'm still young. Like find a mentor, be a mentor. Invest in time and relationships. All of that said, this is all about being invested in what God is doing. It's really not about money. It's about a spirit of generosity. We say it this way at our church all the time that we want to go and make a difference. I just want to connect these two thoughts as we wrap up today. I'm invested by going and making a difference. One person at a time. I'm invested. Are you in? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for these challenging words. They challenge us because they cut right to our motives. And they cut right to a really, really tangible and really important part of life. I want to just take a moment as we pray. And Lord, I want to pray for those who are worried. Where finances are always a barrier that's real. It is really real. And Lord, I don't want my words to ever come off as harsh or demeaning, but Lord, what an opportunity for right now for you to step in and demonstrate how good you are. So I pray for the person who's worried over their finances. Lord, I pray right now for the person who might hear an unintentional message of what we're doing is never enough. Well, I actually come against that. Lord, you've designed each and every one of us for a purpose. And if we're walking out our purpose and if we're walking in faithfulness and generosity, well then, Lord, I pray that you bless us even more. And Lord, I want to pray right now for those of us who might just unintentionally say, I'm not really invested anywhere. 
when you start speaking to us. I want us to be more like the fire and not that little individual coal. I don't want us to say, I'm in. Lord, I want us to say, we're in. And we want to say that to you this morning, Jesus. We're in. We're your church. You've got a mission for us to reach. Lord, you've got people you want us to find. You've got, Lord, you want to help us connect people to your presence. You want to do something incredible. We're right on the cusp of something incredible. I feel it. I feel it. And so on behalf of all of us right now, Jesus, I just say we're in. We're going to follow you. We're going to do things your way. We're going to put things in the right order. We don't want anything that we do to put a barrier between you and us where we might not receive what you have for us so that we can be a blessing to other people. And we pray this in your name because we follow you. All hail King Jesus. And everyone said amen. 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 Hey, everybody, will you say we're in? We're in.